Good morning, church. The first reading is from Psalm 105. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You as his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. Second reading is from Ezekiel 36, 16 to 24. Again, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood on, in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations, and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions, and wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, these are the Lord's people, and yet they have had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name, which the people of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring, bring you back into your own land. Amen. Well, I thought a two-part mini-sermon series concerning Israel at this time in history and in the future was actually necessary and certainly at this time is topical given what's been happening in the world since October the 7th, 2023. And of course, in September, there has been a memorial for what happened in 2001 with the Twin Towers 9-11. So why this series? Well, I want the church to know and those watching online that the Bible biblically declares that God will return the Jewish people to land Israel but that God will return them in two distinctive parts, in two different ways. Israel's return, part one, is what we see now, what has been in the world since 1948. God has promised he will establish the nation of Israel despite their sin. But remember, their sin is no different to ours. From the four corners of the world, God will stir Israel's heart to return to Israel, the nation, to their promised land. God also will use anti-Semitism and the world's traditional hatred of the Jews to force them home. 
Again, I believe that we are seeing this happening now in a force that has not been seen since the Second World War. In 1948, after some 2,000 years, the nation of Israel was born or reborn in a day, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 66. Verse 8, can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. God's part one plan for Israel in the end times is established. It has arrived, it is here, it is well on the way. And then we have Israel's part two return at a future time that has not happened yet. God will take away the veil that he has put over Israel's eyes to stop them seeing Jesus, their Messiah, until the last Gentile that God has appointed comes into his kingdom. And then, as we will see next week, God will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, specifically those people. God will give them a new heart, and God will write his laws on their minds, and they will be all fully for Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We read this both in Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37. God has promised to bring Israel home in two parts. Part one, as a sinful people to the land, and part two, when the veils returned and they repent and they become spiritual Israel. With everything that's going on in the world, specifically this war, this terrible war in the Middle East with radical Islam against Judaism and seemingly of the Western world, radical Muslims against Jews and Christians in many parts of the world. Demonstrations we have seen declaring Palestine will be free from the river to the sea which is a call for the annihilation of the state of Israel, which is the only democracy in the Middle East. Ignorant people, not knowing that there is no such historical nation or people group or ethne called Palestine or Palestinian. They are indeed all of Arab origin. I have done teaching on this in the past. The world has bought a fallacy and a fable and is refusing to acknowledge the truth of history. Take a look at this map. Take a look at this map. The whole of the Middle East and North Africa has been colonized by Islam and Christianity is being brutally stripped out of many countries. In fact, on our news recently, Nigeria has just become majority Muslim. And I read recently over 125 of our brothers and sisters, Christians, have been murdered because they would not convert to Islam. And so persecution is large and big in the world. The so-called Arab Spring, which everyone in the West was celebrating, has not brought freedom to the Arab world, but more radicalization. Think of Afghanistan giving up the opportunity to be free, not standing against the Taliban or fighting for their freedom, but running away in a week. Now the women are the real losers, fully covered, hidden, beaten, oppressed, and a new law has just come out. They cannot show their face, they cannot look at a man, and they must not speak in public. Ladies, celebrate your freedom whilst we have freedom. The accusation that Israel is a colonist, a colonialist state, just does not stand up. It is Islam that is taking the world by storm. And I've done a series of teachings on the ideology of Islam and what it means. At the heart of Islamic ideology is to take the whole world for Allah, 
if necessary, by force, to seize, to dominate, to kill, and to pillage. We have seen the rise of Islam in Europe, and this will increase. Much more trouble is on the way. And I have a sense of humor with everything the UK did, with trying to stop people coming in with the Rwanda plan, and now it seems that Germany may well send people to Rwanda using the facilities the UK has paid. What hypocrisy there is in the world and within Europe itself. As soon as something hits on a doorstep, well, let's forget all of the agreements. We're going to do our own thing. Isn't that the fickleness of human beings? To put this whole scenario, I thought it was important to try to put this into biblical terminology and to share some things with us as church and online. What does the Bible say about this? Is God involved in this or not? Is this just politicians? Is this just well-meaning, ignorant people trying to force a solution on both Palestine, so-called Hamas, and Israel. What is going on in the world? Because it's topsy-turvy. But what we see at the moment is the age-old conflict of the rise of Ishmael against the sonship of Isaac and the lineage, as we have seen and read, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob, who became Israel, and through Israel giving birth to Jesus Christ and to our own faith, Christianity. So what we see in the Middle East, plus the anti-Semitic rise against Israel around the world, is spiritual and it is biblical. Christians need to have their spiritual eyes open, not to be led by false propaganda or a falseness of, of a Christian ethic that says, we must go and help everyone. Whatever they do, we put our value judgments on it. But we need to look at this through spiritual eyes to discern what is really going on. I believe as a Christian pastor and I commend to every Christian listening and in this assembly that we must stand against the traditional anti-Semitism in the church that has actually invaded the hearts of many good, righteous standing, wonderful Christians, giving them a weakness when it comes to understanding Israel and loving the Jews. I remind us all, Jesus was a Jew. And Jesus came to his own people, the Jews. And Jesus is coming back to Israel, to the Mount of Olives, and to Mount Zion. This is what the Bible says. Israel has to exist in its homeland for the return of Jesus Christ. That is biblical. Some here might be thinking, my goodness, why does he keep on banging on about Israel? What is it that, that's got into Chris and he bangs on about Israel? Well, I have done teaching on Israel over the seven years I've been here. I did a series even before any of this happened. I also gave forecasts many years ago as to what is likely to happen with the rise of Islam. So I'm being consistent. It's not just that this is happening now, but this is a timely moment to remind us as born again people of God to see spiritually what is happening in the world. I wonder how many of you at Salt Church have had really good detailed teaching on Israel or sermons on Israel and the end times. How many of you in your Christian experience, God bless you Max, one, three or four, and some of you through me, have you had it before? But not many hands, I don't see many hands going. Maybe I should ask the question. How many of you have not had any real teaching on Israel? How many of you not had an understanding of what's going on in the world? Because if you just take your belief system from the BBC, 
that has just been proven 1,500 times to give biased information about this war in Gaza, perpetuating hatred in the world, then you are going to join that mindset and you will be deceived. It seems actually especially now that many churches are ignoring this topic altogether. I speak to other pastors, and many of them wouldn't touch this with a barge pole. Maybe it's because of my age, but actually I've always touched this issue. It's not my age. I've always touched this issue throughout my ministry because I'm not frightened of what the Bible says, and I want to stand for what the truth biblically is. Not theologically, not what a commentator says, but actually, what does the Bible say? My biggest criticism at uh, my Bible training uh, school was, Chris, you're too biblical. Chris, you're not theological enough. Chris, you need to have a different perspective. Well, I'm aware of all the different perspectives. And having gone through the different perspectives, I have come back to, the, it's the Bible. The Bible makes more sense than what everybody else seems to be saying. But it seems that many churches and church leaders are avoiding this topic altogether out of fear of upsetting people in their congregations. Because in any congregation, there may well be two sides of that story. But what does the Bible say? And people need to be challenged about the truth of it. Well, Israel and the Middle East is the place of the Bible, and the region of biblical history is alive with biblical prophecy, and what is happening today is as the Bible says it will happen. I, do, I hope you realize we are living in the Bible. We're actually turning its pages, and we are seeing age-old prophecy starting and continuing to happen if we know our Bibles, and if we choose to take the Bible biblically. Surely it is important for Christians to have some idea about what is happening. Why Israel? Why does Israel divide religion, divide politics? What is it about this small, insignificant nation in a sea of red that is causing such a shaking in the world? Why Israel? Well, the truth is, the Bible is all about Israel, from start through to finish. But most of the church has forgotten this. Most of the church has replaced Israel, the nation, and God's plans described in the Bible for biblical Israel, the nation. Most churches have replaced Israel these promises with themselves. It's all about me. God has finished with Israel, they say. And they will use scripture to try to justify it. Paul rebuked people when they were saying that in Romans 9 to 11. And he said to us as Christians, yes, you're the wild olive tree. You are grafted in, which is great. But don't get so proud because when God can cut off a branch, he can cut you off as well. And what God has cut off, he can graft back in as well. God cut Israel off from the nation. And now he's grafting them back into the nation. His plans for Israel, to me, are very clear. It's all about the church. I'm sorry, folks. It isn't all about you. It's always been about Israel. And through God's grace and mercy, he's included you. He's included you in his plan of salvation. Hallelujah. And we celebrate that and we're thankful for it. But to reject Israel is at our own peril. It's a huge mistake, and we've read this in the scripture, to say that when God made a promise to the nation of Israel that is written down in the Bible and that clearly relates to the nation of Israel, to say, well, God didn't really mean it. God intended to put the church in instead at some future point. It's poor doctrine and theology. I was always taught 
at Bible College, you look at the text in the context of the text and you work out first what it says in its history. When you look at Ezekiel 36, and we read it, we'll come on to some of the scriptures, it is clearly a reference to nation Israel. The church isn't mentioned at all. It's nothing to do with us. Nor is Ezekiel 37, as we shall see next week. The church loves to abuse scripture, particularly when it comes to Israel and the promises that God has made to them, and make ourselves feel good and apply it to ourselves. Well, I'm sorry, as Paul said, don't get proud, Christian. Don't get proud. What God has cut off, he can graft back in, and he grafted you in, but he can cut you off. And that is something to be taken very seriously. When God makes a promise, when it's written in the Bible, where it clearly relates to Israel, to say he didn't mean it is a huge mistake. Our God, Yahweh, is not double-minded. He's not like the God of Islam, fickle and deceiving. In Gaza at the moment, mothers and fathers celebrate very often the death of their children who have supposedly martyred themselves by killing Jews. They celebrate death. The reason is, the only guaranteed way in Islam to get to heaven is through martyrdom. So Islam celebrates death. Well, I say to you, Lokheim, Lokheim, which is the toast that the Jews say, and many of us say, to life. I say to you in Spain, salud, to health. And I say in English, bottoms up, which I've never fully understood. <laughs> God's promises are yes and amen. For example, God gave the land to Israel. Did you pick up as an eternal covenant? An eternal covenant. God won't break his covenants or his promises. We do that and we do it all the time. So God gave the land to Israel in our reading as an eternal covenant. And he did it in, in a number of ways to Abraham. He confirmed it to Isaac. He confirmed it again to Jacob. But they've never fully occupied the land that God gave them, which is on our screen. From our first Bible reading, Psalm 105. He, that is God, remembers his covenant forever. The promise he made for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham. The oath he swore to Isaac. And he confirmed it. Three times God has given the same covenant promise. And he confirmed it to Jacob as a decree. To Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you, I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. That seems to me to be so clear. And yet many Christians would argue against it. So when God gives a promise to the nation of Israel, he means it and he sticks to it. And the proof of the promise of God is that Israel exists. It's here. The nation is here proving the word of God. Even when the whole world turns against Israel, and it is and it will, God will remain steady and true to his promises to them. But did you know, and I never thought I'd quote in a sermon, the Quran, did you know even the Quran states the land is Israel's, given to the Jews by, in their case, the false god Allah. Surah 520 says this, and remember, when Moses, who was a Hebrew, when Moses said to his people, oh, my people, who are the people of Israel, remember Allah's favors upon you when he raised the prophets from among you, made you sovereign, and gave you what he had never given anyone in the world. O oh, my people, enter the holy land which Allah has destined for you to enter. And do not turn back, or else you will become losers. 
The Quran is clear, and there are many good Muslim theologians who stand against Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran, and prove from their own scriptures that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay, they might include Ishmael, but he gave the land to them, to Israel, and it's theirs, and he's not done that to any other nation, but he has done it for Israel. In fact, Surah 520, or that chapter, goes on to describe our well-known story, the 12 Israeli spies in the land, two give a good report, and 10 didn't. You have to remember that much of the Bible is in the Quran because this religion came 600 years after Jesus Christ. There were no eyewitnesses whatsoever who contributed to the writing of the Quran. In fact, Muhammad had an angel visit him. The Bible says if even an angel comes and visits a man and gives you a different gospel, reject it. It's a false gospel. We know that as Christians. But so much of our history is interwoven and what is happening in the world today through this radical Islam is they are seizing what is ours and they're calling it theirs. They are taking what is good and right and, and proper history and they're changing the narrative to even say that Jesus was a Palestinian. Well, Emperor Hadrian hadn't even come up with Palestinia as, a, as a, a biting of the tongue, a spitting on the Jews, which comes from the word Philistine. Jesus was a, a Hebrew. He was a Jew. No one would say that he was a Palestine. It wasn't even invented then. The whole Bible is about Israel. And indeed, so is much of the Quran about Israel, as I've said. And I want to say that the reason that there's so much about Israel in the Bible is this. God wanted a nation on earth to govern, to show the world how good God is. God's idea was this that all the debauched nations would see how great Israel lived and prospered under God so that the nations would repent and join Israel, become Jews, and would believe in the God of Israel, Yahweh. But the people, Israel, were not willing to be ruled by God. They wanted to be like all the other nations around about. They wanted a human king. Being different is not easy. Swimming against the tide is not easy. Standing on moral principle is not easy. Being holy as a nation, being set apart, when all other nations are eating, drinking, and debauching, is frankly not easy. Being singled out sounds like us in the church. This is a description of us, guys. How are we doing? Are we doing better than the Jewish people and the Jewish nation? Being singled out can be embarrassing. So much better to hide in the crowd as a fish does in a shoal. Safety and protection in numbers. But God relented. He gave Israel warnings about being ruled by a human king. And then to Saul, the people's choice. He looked good. Tall, head and shoulders above the others. Very broad-shouldered, athletic. Well, he'll make a good king. But no, Saul was a bad king and ended up dying on his own sword. Human beings go by sight and propaganda. Christians do not go by what you see on the TV screen and by propaganda. Fact checked, research, get your history right. Know what you are talking about. People go by sight, but God looks at the heart, and God chooses David, a man after God's own heart, to rule Israel. God knows that David isn't perfect. God's plan is for God's anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to come, the God King, to rule from David's line. We all know Israel's history, don't we? The cycle of in the land with God, out of the land against God. Actually, really going for God and worshipping God and then building idols and worshipping idols. For some of us as Christians, we probably have a similar cycle. We probably have a similar cycle depending upon the temptations that come our own way. Israel is known as God's son in the Old Testament 
and God chastises his children. And this is another proof about Israel. Never has a people been more chastised by God than people Israel. You and I have not been chastised anywhere near the way that down the history Israel has been chastised by God. God raised up the Babylonians to punish and discipline Israel. Then he raised up the Assyrians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. Israel in the land, expelled from the land in a cycle until the famous date of AD 70, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the Jews are scattered. A huge date in history. The diaspora, God said, you don't deserve the land, I'm chastising you and you will be driven into the whole four corners of the world and this is the moment. The temple destroyed, desecrated, the Jews fleeing, massacred, murdered, the great diaspora, the fleeing of the Jews into the whole world, into all the nations, coming out of their nation and being dispersed, chastised by God around the world. For 2,000 years they remained dispersed, yet miraculously still a nation, still a culture, still a religion, the Jews, still Jews. The whole world, anthropologists, historians, it doesn't matter what, what type of discipline you look at, it is a miracle and the only one of its kind on the face of the earth. The first part of Ezekiel describes his dispersal amongst the nations. He said, you have behaved like an unclean woman. They have defiled God's name. And Ezekiel 36.20 says, a damning report, wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, these are the Lord's people, and yet they have had to leave the land. Would we get a better report for our faith and our walk with God? I hope so. The truth is Israel should not exist. She should have disappeared hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, like the rest of the Ites. The Amicalites, the Hittites, the Canaanites, all gone. And all the others, including the Philistines, gone. No trace, just archaeology. Enter my second, my last, short, but most important point of this sermon. The first point from Psalm 5, God gave Israel the land as an eternal covenant. But the second point, a two-point sermon from Ezekiel 36 reading. Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things but for the sake of my holy name. Have you read that before? It's not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things. Do what things we come on to? But for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned amongst the nations where you have gone, I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned amongst the nations, the name you have, as if, as if he's telling them and once, twice, and three times, so that they understand they profaned his name. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord. When I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For, listen to what the holy God says. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries, and bring you back into your own land. That happened, and it can't be clearer, in 1948. If you want to know, in the, year, in the time that we live, is there really a God? Because God really exists. Then just look at the history of the Jews and what I'm telling you today. God will be proven holy through them, through Israel, so that all the nations will know that God is God, he is powerful, and it's for his name's sake that he's brought them back to the land. 
It's not because of them. They're sinful like us. They're no different to us. In fact, they're a lot better than most of us. And they're certainly better in their attitudes than I am. And I'm convicted about that. But if you want to know if there's a God today, then he's proving his holy name because they are back in the land. He has brought them after 2,000 years from the four corners of the world, and they're going back. They're back. Seven million of them. And God is using what's happening today in the world today. He's using it to shake them. Anti-Semitism is rife to shake them because God, when he says, I will call you back, a stubborn people might need encouragement to go back. What better encouragement that the university is starting to look a bit like Berlin in 1930s. What better encouragement than things happening in any nation in the world to say to the Jewish people, my goodness, the only safe place for me to live is in Israel. Not in America, not in the United Kingdom, not in Europe. Look what is happening. Islam, the age old war, is seizing the day and taking over. Time for us to leave. It is God who has brought the Jews back to the land. God has set up nation Israel in a day. God is fulfilling his word. It's now historical fact. Ezekiel 36 was prophecy future. It's now historical fact and it's happened. There is a God and he's brought his people home. Despite them in their sin, like the rest of the world, Israel's sins are no worse than the rest. But in my view, Israel's sins are way better than Islam's sins. Way better to life, Lockheim. Saving the guy who started the actual thing from cancer. That's ironic, isn't it? The guy who planned October the 7th, Israel had saved from cancer. I wish they'd let him die. And maybe it would never have been masterminded and would have happened. But God will use everything. God will, is in everything. God is in control. And God is shaking the whole nation, the whole world. And do you know what? I believe God is shaking the church as well. Actually shaking the church. Which side are you on? Do you support my people? Or do you want to obliterate my people? It could not be clearer. God has brought the Jews back. Israel's democracy is way better than the caliphates. When you look at, well, you look at Afghanistan. Israel's morals are way better than Islam. The list goes on. All you have to do is watch the body cam. The celebration of the people in Gaza as they were brutalizing, murdering, and we won't go into the detail, there are children here. Look it up, be informed. But this is the point. God has brought them back to the land he gave them for his name's sake. Think, spiritual eyes, his name's sake, meaning for God's holy reputation not theirs at the moment. That comes next week. This is for God to prove to the mocking world that he is in control. His promises are holy and true. If he breaks his promise with Israel, he can break his covenant with me for salvation. Do you believe that? God has brought them back for his holy reputation, for God to prove to a mocking world, and they're mocking at the moment, that actually he's in control. God has an unblemished character and reputation. Satan doesn't like it. If there is no Israel, then Jesus cannot return. If there's no Jerusalem under nation Israel control, then Jesus can't come back. Why? Because God has given and prophesied the terms of Jesus' return. You just read your Bible. The second coming. Some of this is cropping up in our Bible studies. Folks, saints of God, 
Israel is here to stay. God has done it for his name's sake. The world looks on, trying to manipulate and to control. And remember, Israel doesn't actually have a king. There is no king of Israel. God is king now. God is king. There is no human king of Israel. God is king. And it is God who is pulling the strings, getting ready for the king of Israel to return. King Jesus, the king of Israel and of the whole creation. Whatever anyone thinks about the Jews, remember this, and this will be hard, maybe, for some who are watching, not so much here. To be against Israel is to be against biblical prophecy. Because it's God who's brought them back for his name's sake. It's got nothing to do with humanity. And if we take that logic one step further, then to be against Israel is to be against the very will of God. God has a plan. And the plan works. And boy, is God working the plan. He's calling his people home. And there's going to be a million or more going back, flooding back to Israel after this has happened. Over 50,000 have gone during the war. So to conclude, God is shaking the whole world. We are living in biblical prophecy. We're turning our pages. I believe many more Jews from Europe and the USA will go back to Israel. God is calling and God is using the Gentile anti-Semitic, whether it's in a church or whether it's just plainly in the world, the false narrative, God is using all of this to force them home. We witness God's plan. And actually, here's a holy, terrible God of fire. His holiness will not stand all the rubbish of the politicians, all the ideologies that people choose to believe. There is one truth, and it's biblical. And I'm telling you what it is. We're witnessing God's plan in action. There is more to come. And I end, you'll be pleased to hear. The Bible declares that God will return the Jewish people to Israel and that God will return them in two phases. Part one, which is today's sermon, God will establish the nation of Israel. He did it in a day despite their sin because it's not for them. Is for his holy name and for his plan of action, bringing things together for Christ's return. So part one, today's sermon, is extremely well under the way. But next week, we look at the second part of God's plan for Israel, which has not yet happened, but it will. This has happened, I have no doubt, the next thing will happen. But that's in the future, and it's spiritual Israel. And if you want to read up on yourselves, then read Ezekiel 37, because next week I have more to say about this incredible nation who are no better and no worse than us. Well, actually, I think in many ways are a lot better than me, certainly better than Islam, and I don't mind saying that. How people, universities, professors, and students, how they can support terrorism in the way that they're doing it, they are ignorant numpties. They do not know their true history. They are buying something that is false, that is a lie from the pit of hell, and they've done no research. They've just joined a bandwagon because it sounds good. It's a nice little ditty. But the damage they're doing, they are idiots, absolute idiots. And most of those professors need to resign, and I'm so pleased that many of them have. God help our children. God help our education. Turn it away from wokeism. Turn it away from leftyism. And let's get some common sense back into people. May the Lord bless his word. Anything I've said that is not from him, may it fall like rice paper on the water and disappear.
God bless you. Amen.